Hi, I'm Robin with the Grundy Museum. I'm the educator and coordinator of visitation services here at the museum in Bristol, Pennsylvania, along the beautiful banks of the Delaware River. We're so pleased that you could join us for the premiere of our YouTube channel with our presentation, Corsets and Cumberbunds with Eros Leroy. Roy is a volunteer here at the museum, a local Bristol resident, a master craftsman in the art of sewing and pattern making, and he's been making draperies for us here at the museum during our restoration. We hope you enjoy what you see today and that you'll like and subscribe to our channel. A lot of the museum staff have been producing museum clips that you'll see in the near future. So now, enjoy the presentation, and here's Roy. Hey, thank you all for joining us on this discussion for Corsets and Cummerbunds. I'm going to use this time to try to help you to understand the function of these garments that we mentioned, as well as to dispel a few myths about these garments. The corset terminology comes from the old uh, French word corps, which comes from the Latin word corpus, which means body. The term corset wasn't used until 1828 and the word corset was used in the ladies magazine to describe a quilted waistcoat. Pre-corset history, uh, there's a lot of fashionistas out there who believe the corsets came back early on, corset-like garments. Uh, I don't agree with it. I think the corsets spanned about 350 years in history from the late 15th century up until the early 19th century and even into the 20th but very slightly into the 20th. Uh, pottery and statues that showed nipped in waists and exposed breasts and lift, uplifted breasts as well. Uh, this was mostly in the island of Minos and Crete. Uh, the ancients uh, adored the body, but whether they actually wore corsets, I don't know. They were mostly belts from what we know from going in from that time forward clothing was mostly just robes and kimono cut well into the middle ages and it was very loose fitting accentuating the body was considered very sinful uh, and it wasn't until the renaissance that the body started coming into uh, focus the body of, of corsets came in about the 15th century and they're believed that they have been derived from the breastplates worn in armor the actual origin of the corset is not known. Uh, the styles were starting to emphasize the shaped form and a cinched waist. This was about 1460 they started and were working on uh, getting the body in there. The first corset was called coat, which meant on the rib. The uh, body was actually taken care of uh, by corseting thanks to a very uh, innovative woman at the time, Catherine de' Medici. She popularized the corset when she became queen. She uh, was Italian-French. Uh, when she married the Dauphin, who became the late future Henry II, uh, she married uh, King Henry II on October 2nd in 1533, and she became the queen consort in 1547, and she was the trendsetter of the time as all people back then did follow what the Queen wore. She had great influence for a young woman. She was credited with many introductions in her time. Uh, one of them was uh, cultural uh, in the fact that she made clothing what we know for a long period of time, that was the corset, and it was actually wearing women's drawers. Uh, she also introduced many culinary uh, food items such as the artichoke and lettuce and Parmesan cheese and mushrooms and many sauces. She was uh, also noted for bringing in the dinner fork, but actually uh, closer research showed that it wasn't true. It's just that she used the fork instead of her fingers. There was a big religious uh, fervor, I guess I could use and say at the time where they thought it was sinful to actually use a fork and not use your fingers because God, that's why God made your fingers to eat with. But uh, I think uh, she was probably herself uh, 
fastidious and she brought the fork with her and people started using it. So she was kind of credited with making people start using the fork while eating. She imposed corsets by 1550 on all her court willies. Uh, she encouraged the small waist. She did not like heavy women. It just was the look that she was after. Uh, the silhouette was actually the first time of clothing started following the corset. The corset dictated what the clothing looked like instead of the body, wearing shapeless, like they said, flowing robes from the Middle Ages. Most of the corsets were not corsets as we know today. Actually, the corset really didn't become a separate undergarment until about, oh, the late, six, uh, late 15, 90, 16, 10, around there. She actually had the bodices stiffened. Uh, corsets uh, were actually built into the uh, dress itself and uh, it was stiffened and it was worn on the top. The, uh, the, sh the undergarment was known as the smock and that was worn to protect the body and it was also your night shirt. Uh, you wore it all day and then wore it all night. Uh, these were also help protect the corset from getting soiled and dirty. Okay, the first corsets of the 16th century uh, really came to be an undergarment about, like I said, the end of Queen Elizabeth the first time and they were like this here. This is an actual uh, replica of a Tudor corset, as you can see. As you see, it's stiff all the way down. That was the look. It was considered uh, a flat front. Your beads hung nice and straight. Your breasts were actually pushed up, and they called that clams on the beach. Uh, this was one stiffened with reeds, and of course, it had spiral lacing in the back. It wasn't crisscross as we know it today. The idea is so you could pull this yourself up and down one time if you didn't have anybody to help you with dressing. Also, uh, bust pads were sewn into the corset itself to keep the bust up, and especially if you were largely endowed, you could uh, keep it a little more comfortable and keep your breasts up where it belonged, and the corset stayed where it was supposed to be. The uh, inside is done like this here. Here's a cross section of one. Would have been your outer shell, usually in silk or linen, uh, lined with linen, and most corsets were kind of, uh, let's say, they weren't finished as we would think of today. A lot of them didn't have a lining. You just had this on the inside and caught in. Uh, they were kind of, and just bound along the edges. They were kind of crude from what we know, but of course you weren't seeing the inside of the corset like you did. But this one is done and it was lined in uh, linen as well. Uh, linen was great because it was a natural fiber that they knew how to spin and it wasn't expensive. They didn't have much cotton back then and it was to keep the dirt from the body and also to get, gather the sweat as well. It was cool and comfortable. Okay. Whale bone was used in corsets at that time as well as reeds or even wood. Uh, unfortunately there's no known reason who came up with using the whalebone itself. Now the whalebone is actually not the skeletal frame of the animal. It's actually the baleen, which is the filtration system used in whales for feeding. It looks like a small uh, series of combs or uh, kind of reminds you like an air conditioner filter in a way. It's uh, very flexible. It's made out of keratin, which is in your fingernails, and it was very flexible. The nice thing about reeds and also whalebone, they conform to fit your body. As you wore the corset or the, the bodice that had the boning in it, it actually would conform to your body from through the heat and the sweat of your body. Uh, it was very popular and used well, well into corsets up into the 19th century. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it did cause a bit of a problem with uh, whales being uh, almost extinct. Uh, uh, up into the 18th century, they really heavily used uh, whaling, not only for oil and for the fat, but they also, of course, the whale bones for ladies' fashion. The Renaissance was a great time of rediscovering the body, and at this time, it focused on the first time you actually were seeing nudes and painting and an artwork like it was in ancient times from ancient Roman and Greek times. Uh, the body was considered sinful and was therefore covered very loosely up until this period of time. And all of a sudden you see in the 
time period, anatomy theaters, which became very popular, and yes, you could visit them. Uh, you could go in and dissect or look at a dissected body. Uh, and they th you look at the course designs on some of the earlier ones, uh, you'll see that the whale bones were placed like ribs, like in an actual body. Um, course of designs reflected what people saw in an actual human body and were used very nicely uh, to get that shape of that dress, which is what they were after. The Spanish gave a big, uh, how should I say, they gave the, the biggest influence during the Renaissance. Spain was the superpower at that time, and it was important that everybody followed the superpowers. Everybody wanted to look like the Spanish. Uh, they took their cue of the corsets from Spain, and that's why this corset was done in black. Black was a very popular color in Spanish nobility. And also uh, the farthingale, which was the skirt that came down like this here and into the cone shape to give them the look that they wanted. They had that inverted uh, conical look which was um, also again done with uh, reeds or boning into the skirt to keep out and hold out the skirt. Uh, it wasn't as big as we think of like uh, these hoops that look like skirt or hair today. No, it wasn't the case. It was a case to hold the shape out in a nice, uh, almost like an A-line shape at the time. In the Tudor times also, keep in mind that it was not only the women who wore the corset but also the man did. Uh, not only was his collarbone to keep that huge ruff up, but also his stomach came to a point just like the ladies' fashion. And this didn't appear, uh, disappear until about, oh, about 1580 when the peace cot belly came into being, the, the idea of having a prominent stomach. But men did corset, they did use whalebone, and did have their stomachs pulled in to look uh, just as fashionable, have nipped in waist, just like the ladies. The Elizabethan corset uh, is like on here, done in the Tudor times. Uh, the, the corsets were becoming less rigid. Uh, it was worn with the farthingale, again the skirt, to create uh, either the uh, A-line front uh, down in the skirt, or it became the wheel, as they we see Queen Elizabeth in her later portraits, that big round thing on her skirt that was called the wheel farthingale. Again, uh, to give uh, the waist a uh, looking a little smaller, even though it may have not have been actually that small, the illusion of having that full skirt pulled that in and made that look better. The front was again flat, like it was in her father's time, and the breasts were pushed up. The 17th century, the corsets ranged from very high to very low necklines. They were made of linen and stiffened with reeds, bents, or whalebone. Uh, the prominent bust was considered desirable and was a status symbol among upper class and the aristocracy, even exposed breasts. Uh, this was uh, considered uh, beautiful at the time, and yes, uh, there are pictures even of Queen Mary uh, from William and Mary Fang, actually with her breasts exposed. At this time, tight lacing became in, uh, to being and uh, there were health concerns, especially in the young girls because they were starting to be corseted at a very young age. Even babies were wrapped tightly. Uh, the doctors were very concerned about this uh, first mention of it being a health concern for that time. Uh, the undergarments at that time were very tight. Most of the corsets from the 16th and 17th century have not survived due to the fact that fabric is very brittle. It was also probably reworked into later fashions or bodices and it was expensive because uh, silks were uh, imported, were not at that time being made in the uh, uh, continent of Europe. Very few corsets have survived because most of the women were still boning and stiffening the bodice of the dress. The uh, undergarment that we know it as today actually became prominent in the 18th century. By the 18th century, the corset had become mostly an undergarment. These corsets were made from beautiful fabrics and were highly decorated, usually of silk brocades, and they had narrow tunnels of boning. 
They were so beautiful that corsets actually became part of the front of the dress with the robe stitched to it. The robe anglaise and the robe francaise were stitched to it. Uh, the body itself was uh, made tight under the rib cage here to lift the bust up and pull your shoulders back. Ideally, they were pulled so tight at times that the shoulder blades almost matched and it brought your bust up to the uh, where they wanted it to be prominent. The tabs on the corset were cut for two reasons. Uh, number one, this prevented the skirt from riding up and onto the body and over the corset and it also expanded with the width of the skirts and fitted with the hips. The back was rather low and in the back the uh, as you can see was tightly laced. Again tabs across the back to hold the whole skirt and the bum roll was also still being used from the Tudor times as well as the farthingale. These tabs could also be used to, to uh, have uh, pins or, or they had sometimes eyelets put in them to attach the skirts so they wouldn't ride or slip. Touching on the health concerns which were starting at this period of time in history and this went all the way through women wearing corsets up into the 19th and 20th century. Uh, number one, as you can see, the body was deformed, the, especially when they were starting these in young girls because the bones were soft and it pushed the insides down. They called them the soft bits back then <laughs> and unfortunately those soft bits caused a lot of problems being pushed down and uh, also the skeletal shape being pushed in. You, women couldn't get the breathing capacity they needed or the digestive. Uh, also probably caused much trouble later on with childbearing as well. Uh, there are skeletal remains of women with deformed uh, rib cages because of tight corseting. But keep in mind this was the exception rather than the norm. But to be fashionable at that time uh, it was thought to have a tiny waist. Going into the 19th century, as you can see, the corset all of a sudden became actually very short and almost brassiere like uh, The men were actually wearing the corsets at this period of time, not the women. Again, if you look at the shape of the men's jackets and their waists in this, uh, from about this point of time up until about 1840, men were in corsets to keep that uh, narrow waist look very prevalent. But women, the biggest thing again was the bust uh, and being upheld, but was almost disappearing in the early 1800s to about, oh, about 1820. The uh, corset was just actually like a brassiere, the modern brassiere we know it today. Later, full skirts came back, the waist dropped from under the bust down to the natural waist, and you can see as the century progressed, the waist got not only narrower but also got longer into the uh, hip area because uh, they were at what they called the natural form trying to look sleek and tall. Again, the materials for the corsets were getting better. They were more functional. They were not heavy as far as uh, wearing silks but uh, they were actually doing things like uh, cotton and linen for the average person because most people by this point were starting to wear corsets. The French Revolution influenced dress and also influenced the corset at the time. The early uh, from about 1790 to about 1820, 1830, women were wearing the Empire style as it was called. The French Revolution uh, got rid of the conspicuous consumption of heavy dresses and panniers and farthingales and bum rolls and the classical look came back into being. People were trying to look like Greek statues, especially the women. Uh, it was not unusual for women to have a very small corset, just enough to lift the breast up. It wasn't really a stay as uh, we know it today or a corset. Uh, and also the term stay came into being at this point in history. The women wore dresses that were very clingy, very light material, usually muslin, 
Um, it showed their legs, uh, showed their uh, breasts. Uh, they actually even wore wet petticoats. They would wring them out with water and put them so it would show the shape of their legs. Uh, short sleeve also made the appearance in 1790 at this time in history. Women didn't wear short sleeves up until this point. The 1820s brought in the return of the natural waist and corsets became popular again and became in great use. Two inventions at this early part of history helped make the corset as we know it today. It was the hammered in metal grommets which replaced all the hand sewing of eyelets on the back or on the front of the corset and by 1829 the planchette which we renamed as the bust which really was not a bust but uh, we call it a bust today it was two metal strips down the front of eyelets and little buttons and so people could lace up the back and then pull it in front after they were laced properly by either a maid or a friend or their daughter or sister uh, they didn't have to be relaced all the time. Keep in mind again that men were wearing corsets at this time. Again, they wanted that nipped in and tucked in waist, uh, which fashion demanded. And this continued well into the 1840s. And it fell out of style by the 1850s, although there were still men wearing them. But the only reason they wore them was for, quotations, back pain. The fashion from this time period of the uh, 1830s all the way up until about the turn of the century became uh, mandatory with the hourglass shape which was fairly new and it became the ideal figure throughout the rest of that century. And of course it fluctuated a little bit here and there to the style of the dress but the hourglass figure as we know today was here to stay. The fanciful corsets came back into style between the 1870s to the 1890s and were longer and they ended well below the natural waist uh, because of actually the bustle. The skirts were flat in the front and to the sides and full in the back. Tight lacing again returned to popularity as did the uh, problems associated with uh, tight lacing. The, uh, of course the doctors had a fit about it. Uh, there was uh, a lot of problems with uh, women's posture and digestion but it uh, didn't stop women from wearing them. Uh, they actually took on uh, things called health corsets and exaggerated even the uh, posture even more, resulting in the S-shaped corset uh, by 1910 because these women would have their posture in a kangaroo stance, as they called it, uh, with the uh, bust jutting forward and the, the stomach and the hip thrown back. Uh, these corsets, again, were worn very tight and low that some women could not even sit on them. Looking on these illustrations, you see that the resulting S-shaped corset was damaging to the skeletal frame of the woman's body. This disappeared, thankfully, uh, a little later on in the century. It wasn't worn very long. By about 1910, it made its disappearance. Thanks to the rational dress movement, fashion didn't have to become a painful thing. And uh, I have women say thank you for the Rational Dress Society. Two very famous people were in this, and a lot of people don't realize it was Oscar Wilde and his wife Constance, who were the starting part of the Rational Dress movement. In 1881, the Rational Dress Society was founded with several designers at the time, especially Paul Pure, who took the stand against the uncomfortable and the dangerous fashion of tight lacing and corsetry. This movement helped end the shaping of the corset and it severely uh, hindered the movement of wearing such corsets. The rational desk movement has also uh, helped with lighter, uh, easier dressing at that time. The rational dress movement not only influenced how corsets and women were dressed, but the Industrial Revolution had great effect on how corsets were made. Keep in mind, most corsets early on were made by tailors. They were custom made to each woman. Uh, by the late 18th century, corset factories became uh, common. Uh, one of the biggest one was Symington in London, in England. Uh, the basic corset, because of the cheap labor, of, of especially of women and girls at that time, was cost about 25 cents 
and more elaborate and expensive courses would cost $2 to $3.50. Courses were worn by all women in all classes, and there were many different types of corsets, maternity corsets, corsets for tennis, corsets for bike riding, uh, maternity corsets, uh, and it wasn't uncommon for women to have at least two or three corsets for change. By 1888, the corset industry, along with the whaling industry, supplied uh, a multi-million dollar business. The whaling industry at that time peaked about 1880, and the demand for whaling and whale boning became a multi-million dollar industry. The figures at that time were about $10 million, which in today's money is about $220 million and that was in a year. Not to mention that it depleted the whale population by the demand for the baleen for corsets. The rational dress movement in the 20th century and general health concerns uh, saw many changes in the lives of, of people. By 1912, the modern brassiere was patented in Germany and then in 1914 it was again patented in the United States and started to gain popularity over corsets. The rise of the flappers in the 1920s led to a new style of corset that flattened the curves to achieve the desired boyish figure. By, by the 1930s, corsets made a brief comeback thanks to the uh, antics of actress Mae West who made the gay 90s uh, and that look reappear. Not all women did it, but some did. Women also began to take traditional male jobs by World War II came along and corsets again lost their popularity. Uh, fashions of corsets have gone in and out today. Uh, mainly, uh, they're high fashion and not usually worn on a daily basis. And the corset is still mainly seen in bridal industry uh, for the boning to keep the shape of the body as a lot of dresses in this day are strapless. The corset still remains today, but just in only certain segments of fashion or in reenactments or docents who wear them. Uh, the original tent of keeping a shape is still there, uh, but mostly produced today by undergarments such as Spanx or waist trainers. Uh, famous people who brought back the uh, corset were like Vivian Westwood and Terry Mugler. Uh, Madonna especially noted for wearing her corset. Bra and the uh, girdle itself has, has transitioned from the 1920s up until today to being a very soft and more comfortable garment, not so restrictive as it was back in the 30s to the 1950s and even into the early 60s. There are many misconceptions on the corset. A lot of people have heard the rumor or the story about women removed ribs to achieve a smaller waist. This really frankly didn't happen because surgery at that time was very risky at best and doctors didn't understand the uh, importance of germs and bacteria. Uh, so to have a, a rib removed would have been the absolute last minute thing to do to bring your waist down. Photographs and pictures of the time were retouched and exaggerated just like fashion is today to make the waist look smaller and the overall body shape look smaller as well. Uh, if you look at a lot of the fashion pictures of the time, the illustrations, you'll find if you take your thumb or your uh, even a tape measure or a ruler, you'll find that the waist on the dress and the waist, uh, I mean the circumference around the neck is the same uh, length. It couldn't be. Uh, the average woman today is about 12 and a half to 13 and a half around her neck. There is no way she would have that around her waist back then. The average waist back then, uh, from having corsets measured, uh, there has been a study done on them, uh, was actually around 23 to 24 inches uh, uh, average. The waists were only pulled in about one or two inches, just to give you some shape. Considering three inches was excessive in the time, most women didn't do it. Also keep in mind, women had to work in these things. They had a house to clean. They had to, uh, believe it or not, stoke their fires, do their wash by hand, bend over to pick up a child, or bend over to cook on a stove. Uh, corsets were not as constricting as we would like to think they were, uh, but they did keep the shape of the dress. Keep in mind that was the whole idea of the corset of the time, to uh, fit the silhouette of the dress. 
A woman was only about five foot one average in the Victorian time, so having a waist of about 21 to 24 inches maximum was not unusual. It would be about right proportion-wise. While corsets were falling out of the fashion, uh, there was men's fashion, which was the cummerbund, which was gaining popularity with, as the new garment of the time. Cummerbunds came about from ancient Persia and were used in India by about the year 1616. Cummerbunds were wide sashes of fabric at the time, usually wrapped around the waist twice and were tied or knotted at the end or secured with pins or ornate clasps or even buckles. The cummerbund itself served as pockets and it secured swords and pistols and even men kept their tobacco and money in them. The cummerbund as we know it today was came into use by the British forces in India during the colonial period. Uh, in the hot weather of India and a lot of the Asian countries that they were in, uh, it was a little impractical to be wearing a waistcoat or a vest as we call it here in America. So the cummerbund became the popular item around the waist. It eventually became part of civilian dress and an evening dress as well. Even railroad conductors, ticket collectors, uh, and the like would use it to carry keys, their punch or their ticket stubs, and even kept money in it to make change and even sometimes pens and papers. The formal wear of cummerbunds was almost always black or deep navy with the pleats worn up. The idea was to catch crumbs when you were dining. A uh, Victorian man never ever put his hand across his lap to brush away crumbs. That was considered a very obscene gesture of the time. Uh, so the idea of the pleats were to catch the crumbs. When you sat up, you didn't see the crumbs on your pants. When men got up for women to leave the room to go to have their coffee while men stayed behind. Today, the cummerbund is used in formal wear still. Uh, the United States Army uses uh, cummerbunds and dress and it's to be pleats worn down and the United States Navy wears their pleats up and of course they still retain the name of the crumb catchers uh, so they don't get crumbs on their laps during the mess so now you know the difference between a military man when you see the direction of his pleats other military forces in the world continue to use the cummerbund in their uniform and today uh, they're used in formal wear, again, more comfortable than the vest. Thank you for taking the time today to work with us uh, exploring corsets and cummerbunds here at the Grundy Museum. If you like what you see, please like and subscribe our, to our channel. Uh, my name is Zero Saroy. I thank you again for taking the time to view us and hope we, we can do this in the near future live.